Let's turn to the Gospel of Luke chapter 2. And in the opening of this year, I've been doing teachings in reference to the Epiphany. There are five primary Bible stories that deal with the Epiphany, all of them having to do with the revealing of who Jesus Christ is. Epiphany means revelation. It means a new revelation, not a replacement of something old with something new, not a replacement of the Old Testament with the New Testament, something altogether never having been seen before is on the scene. That's epiphany, revelation. We read the Bible, we think we got all the stuff figured out, but when all that takes place in these stories, in that context, this is as new of a new thing as you can imagine. The epiphany is God became flesh, and that's as new as it's ever going to be in terms of newness. And so there are five primary stories that surround the epiphany, the angels revealing who Christ is to the shepherds, the magi coming from the east and having that, following that star and seeing the Christ child, Jesus being presented at the temple with the story of Simeon and Anna, John the Baptist who baptizes Jesus and says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And the one that we looked at last week, which is the wedding feast of Cana, where Christ performs his first, performs his first miracle in the beginning of his ministry and reveals his glory and his disciples believe in him. This morning, we're going to take a look at the story of Jesus being presented at the temple and the story of Simeon and Anna. And the title to this message this morning is Old People Who See. Now, this is, just, this is not just a, a teaching for old people. Okay. It's in the title, so it'll be obvious. This is really a teaching for those of you who are young, in your teens and 20s and 30s. Even though these are two people, Simeon and Anna, who are old, it's about how we get to where they are over a lifetime. So, let's pray. Father, I thank you for this day. And I thank you for this gathering, and I thank you for your word, and I pray, Lord, that you would open our hearts and cause us to see things and to be stirred and to be challenged in the best way and lead us by your Holy Spirit. Cause us to want to know you more and walk with you more, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, before we jump into the story of Simeon and Anna, I want to tell another story. And um, it's about a guy that I went to high school with a long, long time ago. His name is Joe. I hadn't heard from Joe in all the years since I'd graduated from high school. And a couple of years ago, he sent me an email out of the blue and said, I'm thinking about writing a book. I've recently retired. And I want to write a book about a period of time in our high school history when certain things went on. Would you be willing to allow me to call you and us to have a conversation about your recollections of that period in time, which is the late 60s, early 70s. In that period of time, the Vietnam War was still going on. There was much social protest and unrest. We were entering our senior year of high school. It was the only year that our high school won the state football championship uh, with an underdog team. He was on the football team. And the summer before our senior year, one of our class officers was shot and killed just a few blocks away from where we went to high school. So that's how we started our senior year. A lot of turmoil, death of a young friend, and just trying to make sense of life when life in that context really wasn't making very much sense at all. It was a Catholic 
all-boys college prep high school. That's the context that he was going to write from and build this little story around the football team of that year. I obviously was not on the football team. <laughs> but he was a member of the student council, I was a member of the student council, and so he wanted to get my input on that year from uh, a, a little different perspective than just the football perspective. And I agreed to that. We did the interview, it was great. He came here and visited one Sunday morning. We went out to lunch, had a great time. That was kind of the end of it. I'll leave the story there for now. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. Let me give us uh, the, the setup in this. Mary and Joseph bring Jesus, who is, when you hit 41 days, they go through the, the, the law rite of purification for a newborn child. Eight days in, they're circumcised. 33 days later, if it's a male, you bring them to the temple, you present an offering, and uh, the priest does the purification rite. So that's what Mary and Joseph are doing with Jesus. He's a very young, newborn baby. And so they come to the temple, to Jerusalem, with the baby, and presenting their offerings, and we'll pick it up in verse 25. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and this man was just and devout waiting for the consolation of Israel. And the Holy Spirit was upon him, and it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple. Now, Luke wrote this gospel and the book of Acts. And Luke is very generous in his writings in making reference, a lot of reference, to the work of the Holy Spirit. In these few lines that we read, Luke references the Spirit three and a half times. He says the Spirit is upon Simeon. He says the Spirit is revealing things to Simeon. And he's saying the Spirit is directing Simeon. And the half piece is... He was waiting for the consolation of Israel, consolation, the parakletos of Israel. And so here's a man who is led, directed, the Spirit is upon him, and it's indicating that Simeon isn't coming by his own sorting it out or his own plans or his own determinations. It's by the Holy Spirit at work in him. Now, I, I do tend to think we struggle with that sort of thing because we think most of what we do in our spiritual life is by our plans and determinations and efforts. And that's okay. We're not taking away from that. But here it's the Holy Spirit altogether is the only one that can do this thing that can cause this man to come in and see this baby for who he is. This old man, who's a total stranger to Joseph and Mary, walks up to the couple, takes hold of the baby, hugs him closely, and begins to publicly proclaim who this child is. I'm trying, I've tried to get my mind wrapped around that little picture. I mean, there's Mary and Joseph. They've got a newborn baby. They're in this, this very large temple in a large city away from what they're used to. And a strange old man walks up to him and goes, ah, and takes hold of the baby and hugs him and starts speaking these incredible things to this baby. I'm like, what, were, what did they think? See, we read all this Bible stuff. So we, we know all these other stories around it all. So we figure they're on top of all this. He's like, of course he's Christ, because we know all that. Think of it in, in that earliest time period where you know, it's like these pretty remarkable things. The Magi had not come yet, more than likely. So it's just the angels and the shepherds. They've got some incredible things, but basically it's a baby. And here's this other additional epiphany piece. So verse 27, let's go on. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, which was that rite of purification, he took him up in his arms and he blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your, I'm going to add, old servant depart in peace according to your word. 
For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. This child, he is saying, is God's salvation. He is the one that God has prepared for all people. He is the one to bring revelation. Simeon's going, he's the one, in essence. You know, it's like, ah, there he is. And just blurting it out. Notice it's not Simeon bringing revelation. It is Christ who brings the revelation. A light to bring revelation to the Gentiles. Simeon is the mouthpiece for what God is doing. Hold on to that thought. Simeon is the mouthpiece for what God is doing. Okay, just, just keep that piece in place. And the parents marvel at his words, verse 33. And Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Now, in that moment, Anna enters into the scene. She's an old woman. She's about 84 years old or possibly 105 years old. Either way, you're elderly. It says she spent her life in the service of the temple, fasting and praying. And she, too, knows who this child is and begins telling anyone who is willing to hear. Let's read verses 36 to 38. Now there was one Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel, of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple, but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked or were waiting for redemption in Jerusalem. The epiphany piece here is that Simeon and Anna open up New Testament prophecy. They're the first to prophesy in the New Testament as to who this child is. There are two saints near the end of their lives. Simeon had gone all of his life, Anna as well. And listen to the words that we just read, let me highlight, that are used to describe these two obscure individuals. They spent their lives looking, they spent their lives looking, seeking, waiting, Lots of years of waiting. Praying, fasting, gathering at the temple, giving thanks, speaking of Him, blessing God, and living lives of justice and devoutness and devotedness. That's all the words that are used in this little story about these two individuals. See, we tend to think of salvation as a point in time. That's our general framework. We ask the question, when did you get saved? With that question, we expect you to give an answer that satisfies our understanding of that question. When did you get saved? And then you say, well, I got saved at this youth camp or whatever it is. And they're like, okay, you're good. I'm good. You gave the right answer. Are you with me? This little story talks about two people who just gave their whole lives waiting, watching, looking, praying, being devoted, just doing whatever it is they knew to do. And then they saw the Lord's salvation. Simeon is this obscure, unknown layman. There's nothing more in the Bible spoken of him. He just kind of pops in, says some words. Anna likewise pops in, says some words. 
This layman who had been waiting a lifetime. He's not a priest. He's not a Levite. He's not a pastor. He's you. Anna is this insignificant widow. Widows had no standing, no authority, no clout. She spent her life in the temple. She'd been that way her whole life, her whole adult life, 60, 70 years serving in the house of God. And yet it is these two that the Holy Spirit elevates to being the first prophet and prophetess upon Christ's birth. Let me say something to all of us. Don't ever diminish who you are in Christ. I'm just a church member. I'm not a leader. I'm not that spiritual. If you have any sense of Christ and who he is, God wants to use you. And he may use you in ways far beyond what you might have ever thought. Can you imagine going your whole life waiting and yearning and hoping 60, 70 years? God giving you some kind of promise and you never see it. And then one day you do. That's remarkable. I think most of us would give up. We go, ah, it's not, it's not going to happen. These are two people who were what you would call believers. You know they struggled in their faith. They had been doing the same thing however they'd been doing. It says Anna was a prophetess, but I think she was a prophetess because of this event. It was that event that made her the prophetess. Our faith and our faithfulness will not go unrewarded. Our waiting, our serving, our looking will not go unrewarded. I said the title of this is Two Old People Who See, but I also said this is for anybody who's a teenager, who's in their 20s, who's in their 30s. Your waiting upon God will not go unrewarded. Our natural eyes will grow dimmer as we age. You hit a certain point in life and they tell you you need glasses, whether you want them or not. You you know, your arm goes out like this so you can read the print on the page. It's just the way it goes when you get to a certain point. Our natural eyes will grow dimmer as we age, but the eyes of faith will see more and see more clearly as we age. I believe that's true. I believe walking like these guys did, just in waiting and hoping and looking and serving and showing up, their eyes saw more clearly. Let me put it like this. There's no spiritual hardening of the arteries in Simeon and Anna. Their faith, their hope, their looking for God is more alive and more attentive than anyone else in the temple. And the temple was filled with people. And there were the high priest is there, and the Levites are there, and there are people gathering in to do their, their um, sacrificial offerings and all the kind of stuff that went on in the temple. But these two were completely dialed in, if you will. Their faith alive. Old Simeon, the layman, sees. Old Anna, the widow, She sees their faith and their faithfulness kept them seeing their entire lives. Now, let me go back to the story of my old friend Joe. So we did the little interview on the phone, said goodbye. That's the last I thought of it. And then a couple of months ago, I got another email. Joe said, hey, I finished my book. I hope you read it. I thought, great, all right, fine. And then I thought, you know, I might read it. And he said, 
And would you come and be on a discussion panel about the book on a certain date in St. Louis at the high school? He says, there are going to be about 20 or 30 guys on the discussion, about 20, I can't remember the number now, 20 guys on the discussion panel, and about 150 people showing up for the event and, and some press. And, and I'm like, oh, oh. And then I read the book. And I was a, a bit surprised at the fact that he, he actually references the statements I made about a dozen or 20 different times within the course of the book. I honestly didn't think I said much, but he did a very good job of listening to what I said, and he, and he got it right. There was no distortions. He wasn't uh, you know, just adding to things. He, the things I said are the things that are, are in there, and I thought, oh, oh, okay. Somehow he included me, the non-football guy, in the equation in the story of a, of a book about football. The title of the book is Bull in the Ring, which is a, a football scrimmage thing that they did. Um, and the subtitle is Football and Faith, Refuge in a Troubled Time. So after I read the book and I saw how many references that he made, I thought, you know what, I, I, I better go. I think it, it wouldn't be good if I didn't. So Deb and I went to St. Louis for an evening. And there were, you know, all those people that were there. Um, can we show the picture here? <clears throat> this is a serious gathering of old men. Uh, I mean, let's just, let's just dispense with it. This is not a very flattering picture. We didn't, this was not posed because most of them look dead or asleep. <laughs> See, the, look at those guys. I mean, they're not, they not a sharp-looking group of guys, but they were, you know, they were the football team back in the day. That guy there played for MU. He's a foot, he was a fullback uh, back, back in the day. Um, uh, that's me with the microphone. That's another guy who's a class officer. We're the two small guys that are up there. Uh, that's the author of the book, Joe, right, right there. So when, uh, when they asked the question and no one was grabbing the mic, I, I thought, well, let's get this thing on the road. So I took hold of the mic. And uh, I started off by uh, telling Joe, uh, thank you for writing the book and explaining my troubled past and how it now makes sense to me and, and I can quit therapy. So thank you very much <laughs> for writing, writing the book. Um, but it was more than just a book about a football story. The football piece was just the the centerpiece, so he could wrap some other things around it. Football and faith. You know, a high school team that won a state championship. Fine. But that's not what he really wrote. What I learned is that the book told the story of a high school football team and then some, but it was really a story about having your eyes and heart made open, having your eyes and heart made open. Some of the chapter titles are Change the World, Thoughts of the War, Getting Involved, Black in America, Finding a Hotel in Springfield, Missouri that would allow a black football player to stay there. Another chapter title, How Does It Feel to Be a Negro Lover? Except Negro isn't the word he uses. Homecoming coronation with a black escort of a white girl. When you hear those headings, you go, this is more than a book about football plays. Now it's interesting. Joe's a white man. He became a successful executive. He retired early. He has lived his entire life in his faith. He is most likely a social conservative. He has no reason to be otherwise. That's worked well for him. He has a wonderfully nice wife and kids and life. And he's a good guy. But he didn't write a book about football. And he didn't write a book about bygone days. 
he wrote a book about transformation. He wrote a book about growing up one way and living life and having his eyes transformed to see things differently later in life. But it took all his life. A book about seeing what he had not seen most of his life. A book about reevaluating how he sees and what he sees and how it is changing him as he is in the latter stages of his life. In some of the closing pages of the book, he says this. As I look back over the years, I examine my own track record of getting involved to confront social injustice and must humbly submit a thin resume. I wonder if... Eli Wiesel would have judged me harshly for not seeking out a broader stage on which to tangle with the injustice that persists to this day. Wiesel was a survivor of the Nazi concentration camps whose parents and sister died there. And he had spent much of his life imploring citizens to get involved. When you witness an injustice, don't stand idly by. When you hear of a person or a group being persecuted, do not stand idly by. When there is something wrong in the community around you or far away, do not stand idly by. You must intervene. You must interfere. Joe writes, it is true of me and I'd say of most of my classmates that we have done little to bend the grand arc of world history. Obviously, this is not a quote about football, is it? He's making a broader statement. He asks questions that come out in the course of the book. What did it feel like to be black in America then, and what does it feel like today? What kind of prejudice do you, as a black man, experience in life that I, as a white man, never was aware of. What was it like to be gay and have many friends die of AIDS in the 80s? What did it feel like to suffer PTSD, the result of the war of Vietnam? And what did it feel like to be a minority in a white privileged school? The title, I said, was Old People Who See. What's this guy seeing in the later stages of his life? Joe's old, but he sees something afresh, and he's bringing it to others. His faith and his conscience is fully alive. He is absolutely mixing his faith with his conscience, with his conversations, with those who are both like him and unlike him, those who agree and would disagree with him. He is mixing an alive faith with a heightened consciousness into humble, probing conversations to learn things that he had not engaged in most of his life. And I have to say, I think his faith is as alive and as energized as any person that I know. The closing story in this book tells of when the clock ran out and they won the state football championship and two teammates hugged each other. One was a young black man whose parents brought him up to St. Louis from Alabama so that they could get away from the dangers of living in Alabama in that day. The other was a young white man who lived in the suburbs of St. Louis, and his father was a physician, and he lived a a secure life. Those two guys, at the end of the game, hugged each other. The young black man's name was Errol, and Errol said this, That was the best hug I'd ever gotten. (laughs) And he said it, and Joe quotes it, and he said it in front of his wife of 30 years. 
Now, she just stood there and smiled. And he said, she understands. And she did. And it wasn't about, yay, we won the championship. It was about, we went through something together that changed our lives. Tomorrow's Martin Luther King's day, the day we honor him. Martin Luther King Jr. was a prophet who saw. He did. He spoke things that are powerful. One of his quotes, and there are many, but I pulled this one up. An individual has not started living until he or she can rise above the narrow confines of his individualistic concerns to the broader concerns of all humanity. Luke chapter 2 and some verses that I skipped over, but I'm going to come back to them. Verses 34 to 35 read this way. Then Simeon blessed Mary and Joseph and the child and said to Mary, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. As long as you and I are drawing breath, God is not done revealing himself. Don't think for a moment that he's done with you or that you have him figured out. He's going to continue as long as you have breath revealing his heart And he's going to continue to reveal the thoughts of your own heart. All with the desire of drawing us into greater faith. All Simeon and Anna saw was a helpless baby. No miracles, no teaching, no authority. They were two people who were enabled by the Holy Spirit to see salvation in just a seed form. And that was enough to cause them to speak out. So I'll close with these few questions. What are you waiting and looking for? Are you looking just to see what's in life for you? Are you waiting for things to just go your way so you can be happy? Or are we called to wait and look and pray day and night so that we can see God doing His work of redemption and justice. Are you asking him to enable you by the Holy Spirit to be a vessel of love and light to others? When we go in that direction, our prayers will not be unrewarded. Let's stand.